What's up? I'm B, and welcome to my channel. I hope you're having an amazing day today and you are ready to get into all of the complexity of Teal Swan, her practices, her business, and her internet presence. Before we get into the actual meat of the video, though, I do want to announce that starting now and from now on, everything I upload, every video that I make will obviously be uploaded to YouTube. However, I will also be uploading the audio to podcast format. So that way, if you're in the car, you're driving around, you want to go into a different app and you don't have YouTube premium, you can still hear what I am saying and you can still consume the content. My husband has been on me about it for the past six months. He's like, I think that would be a really good idea. You should upload it to podcast format. And I just haven't done it. But last week, my sister made the same point and said that she was in the car and wanted to listen to one of my videos, but she didn't want to have YouTube open. And so podcasting would be a great way to also upload the content. And she was right. My husband was right. But you know, you know how sometimes it is your spouse tells you to do something and you're like, mm, yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. And then somebody else makes the same suggestion and you're like, oh, that's a great idea. That's kind of where we're at. But regardless, as soon as this video goes up, you will be able to hear it as a podcast and I will be linking it down below. And also I will have the Q&A that I did with ex-pastor Jeremy Jernigan on there and my most recent video about Brittany Dawn's court appearance. Those will already be there. So if you've not gotten a chance to watch those videos and you want to listen to them, they are available for you. But without any further ado, let's get into Teal Swan. Buckle up, y'all, because this topic is a doozy. Teal Swan was born Mary Teal Bosworth on June 16th, 1984, and she was born in Santa Fe, New Mexico, but moved to Utah sometime in her childhood. And from what I could find, her family lived in Logan, Utah, which is about an hour and a half outside of Salt Lake City. And um, I feel like you'll understand why I'm talking about this as we get into the topic and we learn more about Teal. Salt Lake City is a very Mormon heavy town. It's in their architecture. It's in a lot of their laws about alcohol at different restaurants and in the way people talk to each other and interact with each other. And while Mormons, um, in a lot of cases have really great values and can be very kind people, it's also a very clicky religion where you're taught to be kind to people who are not Mormons. But I think there's also kind of that element where people who are raised in the Mormon church are taught that because of their beliefs and because of their history and how they live their lives, they're a little bit more elevated. And as they get more and more elevated, they're going to get into higher levels of heaven. And I'm not saying this to be judgmental or rude towards Mormon people, but I did uh, go to high school in a very, very Mormon town. And so I'm just kind of speaking from my experience and from things that I've seen um, other current and past Mormons talk about in person and online. And so I think if you move into a very, very heavily Mormon populated town, you're already going to feel a little bit like an outsider if you're not in the church. And that can contribute to some different feelings of exclusion and loneliness and stuff like that. So I would just keep that in mind as we go further into this. But Teal Swan, as of now, she's an adult and she is an author, speaker, YouTuber. She has 1.3 million subs on YouTube and she also hosts retreats and conferences for spiritual healing and elevation. She also sells frequency paintings that you can buy and um, basically it's designs that she makes and you can put them on a mug or a t-shirt or a pillow and you're supposed to use these specific frequency paintings to get benefits out of them. One such example is the compatibility frequency painting that she created and it, you can get it printed on an oven mitt. And it says the state of being in which two or more things are able to coexist and come together in combination without problems or conflict. All of our oven mitts are custom made to order and handcrafted to the highest quality standards. The single oven mitt is $20. And one of my questions about these frequency paintings, because I'm not somebody who's totally opposed to um, manifestation, spirituality, frequencies, energetic healing, stuff like that. I find it very interesting and I participate to some degree in that sort of realm. But you're saying like, I'm going to sell you this frequency painting that's going to give you a happy relationship. It's going to give you more money. It's going to give you companionship. It's going to, you know, bring you into alignment. 
but you have to have it on a mug for it to work. Like, why couldn't you just take a screenshot of the frequency and look at that and have it do the same thing? I don't know, just food for thought. But anyway, the reason I wanted to do this content series on teal because it's going to be a multiple part um, series. It's kind of like a companion to the freeform documentary, The Deep End. It's on Hulu. That's where I'm watching it. And I'm going to go episode by episode with what they discussed. But the reason I want to talk about her is because the type of work that she does and the promises that she makes are really concerning to me. Like I said, she is an author. She hosts retreats. She is doing very, very personal work on a very, very large scale, and she does not have any sort of certification or qualification to do that. That's not to say that she's not good at what she does, and that's not to say that she hasn't helped anybody or that you, you know, you get a certificate in something and you're automatically amazing at it, but she does her work unregulated, and she is messing with very intimate parts of people's lives. She also um, makes promises about the quality of life that her followers can have if they just listen to her and do the work. And a lot of this work is being in community with Teal, being part of the Teal tribe, coming to retreats, participating in her events. And I think when you are working on people's personal development and emotional fulfillment, it can be really risky because almost everybody wants to have community. They want to feel included. They want to feel like they are doing well and progressing and getting better. And in my opinion, Teal takes advantage of this. When you have somebody who is willing to do just about anything to recover from a traumatic incident or progress in their life or make their relationship better or feel like they are overcoming depression, when you have people with very real, very personal issues they can get to a point where they are desperate to fix them and they're willing to do things that they wouldn't normally do because you are promising that you can make them feel better. And so in my opinion, Teal Target's a very vulnerable sect of people and I think it's important to assess her tactics and what she does from a point of, I'm not sitting here trying to attack her, say she's a fraud, say that she's the worst person in the world and you need to avoid her at all costs. But I do think it's important to talk about some of the things that she does and why they are concerning, which is what we're going to do. This first installment of the series is going to be a lot longer, I think, than the remaining episodes, although who knows because I obviously haven't filmed them yet. But I did just want to go into her background and give some examples of why there might be doubt about certain parts of her story before we get into what was actually included in the episode. And I've listened to a lot of podcasts about Teal. I've watched some of her videos. Um, I, I'll link several podcasts down below. There's The Gateway, Someplace Underneath, and Sinisterhood. The Gateway was specifically dedicated to covering Teal Swan, and she participated in it. And then Someplace Underneath and Sinisterhood just did episodes about her. And so there's a lot of info and something that I'm going to discuss that might make you a little bit angry at me and might make you upset and might hurt your feelings. So I'm giving you the fair warning now is that I have doubts about certain aspects of Teal's childhood according to Teal. I'm going to tell you right now that one of Teal's biggest selling points on herself is that she was victim to a madman who held her captive for roughly 13 years, who sexually assaulted her and abused her and killed people in front of her. And not only did he do this, but he was part of a larger cult and Teal escaped. And so because she's been through the worst of the worst, that's why she's qualified to help people. And I don't make it a habit of um, questioning people when they say that they've been through something awful But there are certain elements of this story that I feel it is important to discuss. And I'm not saying that Teal did not experience abuse or trauma of any kind. I'm just saying there are certain parts of the story that are questionable from an objective basis. And sure, in a lot of cases when somebody is assaulted, um, objectively, it can be hard to figure out the facts because in a lot of, you know, a lot of times it is sort of he said, she said thing. And so... Like I said, I understand if me questioning this 
makes you upset and makes you angry and um, is frustrating to you. I have empathy for that. And like I said, I don't like to make a habit of saying like, well, I don't believe that happened when somebody tells me that something terrible did happen. But I'm going to be honest about how I feel about this. And I'm going to bring some resources in that I think kind of back up the doubt that I might have of certain elements of this story. And I just know that I'm not saying this to hurt anybody's feelings. It's more so that I want people who are considering becoming part of the Teal tribe to be fully aware and to kind of understand the larger scale of things. According to grayfaction.com, quote, Swan claims to be a victim of satanic ritual abuse, memories of which she claims she repressed and later recovered with the help of a therapist in Salt Lake City, Utah, who encouraged her to go to the police to open an investigation in 2005. Swan's claims include that she was once sewn into a corpse by a Mormon satanic cult. However, that investigation came to a halt when it was discovered that Swan's therapist was at the center of several nearly identical and similarly questionable allegations of satanic ritual abuse in Utah during the throes of the satanic panic. Diana Hansen Rivera, who grew up with Swan, says that Swan was abused by her therapist, not some satanic cult. That therapist is named Dr. Barbara Snow, and she continues to practice today. She is also a member of the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, an organization that has openly promoted satanic panic conspiracies for decades, end quote. Another article from FairLatterdaySaints.org states, quote, The ritual child or satanic abuse scare in the 1990s in Utah began in 1985 in Lehigh, Utah, as described by social historian uh, Massimo Introvigne. Sorry if that was wrong, but I tried my best. This historian says, quote, During the summer of 1985, Mrs. Sheila Bowers of Lehigh, Utah, contacted Dr. Barbara Snow, who was Teal's therapist, um, a therapist working with the Intermountain Sexual Abuse Treatment Center. Bowers was worried about her three small children who seemed to talk too freely about sex. Dr. Snow interviewed the children and concluded that they had, in fact, been sexually abused. Dr. Snow claimed that the children had told her about the perpetrator, a teenage babysitter who was the daughter of Keith Burnham, the respected bishop of the Lehigh Eighth Ward of the Mormon Church. Dr. Snow also asked to interview other Lehigh children who had been attended by the same babysitter, and most of the families involved decided to comply. End quote. The article goes on to say, as a result of the interviews, the Burnhams were accused of abusing a number of children in the area, and the Burnham parents were accused of abusing their own children. Utah's Family Services Division investigated the Burnham parents and found no evidence of abuse. Additional interviews with other children led to claims that children in the area were being forced to participate in satanic rituals. Police began investigating these various claims when the police concluded their investigation in 1987. Dr. Snow had accused 40 adults, almost all of them active Mormons in Lehigh's 8th Ward, to be ritual child abusers and members of a secret satanic cult. Only one individual was charged with child abuse. And during his trial, a county attorney asserted that Dr. Snow was forcing children to admit abuse that the children never experienced. Dr. Snow made additional accusations over the next two years about satanic cults in Bountiful and Salt Lake City, Utah. An investigation was started in Salt Lake, but discontinued after more than a year. It was during this period that the Utah State Task Force on Ritual Abuse was created in March of 1990. This task force was created to investigate claims of ritual abuse in Utah and provide education to professionals and the public on the possibility of ritual abuse. To assist with the investigation of claims, the Utah State Attorney General's Office later assigned individuals to investigate these claims and prepare recommendations for future investigations. In a report published in 1995, the Attorney General's office explained that during an exhaustive two-year search, the unit has investigated over 125 cases of alleged ritual crime. The investigation report concluded, The complexity of the problem required detailed planning, tireless research, and cooperation. Every police chief, sheriff, law enforcement executive, many of the state's therapists, religious leaders, and community leaders were contacted. Investigators statewide were told stories of bizarre sexual and physical abuse. Utah's police officers and their departments have dedicated thousands of hours as they followed up on allegations, searched hillsides for ritual sites, staked out potential ceremonies, etc. Their combined efforts were unable to uncover any physical evidence to support the claims of the existence of organized cults. The allegations of organized Satanists, even groups of Satanists who have permeated every level of government and religion, were unsubstantiated. 
The report also warned against recovered memory therapy, which had been prominently used by therapists, including Dr. Snow, to uncover ritual satanic abuses. Often the reports of victims are based on recovered memories, which were blocked out at an early age and are only recalled after some intensive therapeutic intervention. This therapy often includes hypnosis. The Utah Supreme Court has said unequivocally that a per- prosecution cannot be based upon testimony that is hypnotically refreshed or enhanced due to the unreliability and suggestibility of that process. Most courts throughout the country which have addressed the issue have ruled that the outcome of hypnotherapy is not reliable enough to be admissible in court proceedings. Even when hypnosis is not directly involved, there's enough controversy about the entire issue of recovered memories in the field of psychology that the courts are unlikely to admit such evidence without showing the memory of the victim is reliable. I know that that was a lot to take in, but just a few key things to remember are that Teal Swan uh, claimed to have been the victim of Mormon satanic ritual sexual abuse. She claimed this after being treated by Dr. Barbara Snow, who has participated in multiple other cases where she claims to have uncovered repressed memories from children where they are now saying that they've been abused. And a lot of these claims, and some of them have gone to court, have been unsubstantiated. There has not been enough evidence to convict anyone in most of these cases. There have been several men who have gone to jail as a result of um, claims leveled against them by alleged victims who had received therapy from Dr. Barbara Snow. But that number is really low. And I'm not saying that to say like, oh, well, if they were innocent and they're in jail, at least it's only a few of them. I'm just saying that out of the multiple claims that Barbara has made, there's not enough evidence to prove it. And again, that doesn't mean that it didn't happen because something can happen and there can be no evidence of it other than your own memory. That's not to say that kids don't block hard things out. I am sure that they do. There's a lot of people who go through a really tough time and they're just like, well, I really can't even remember much from it because it was so terrible and traumatic. That is totally valid. But I don't trust Dr. Barbara Snow. Why all of a sudden is it that when people go to see her, they suddenly recover memories of ritual satanic abuse? How likely is it that there's just this massive underground network of satanic cults in Salt Lake City, right? Just using critical thinking skills. Why aren't any of the recovered memories like, I don't know, I I got into a car accident that was really traumatizing for me or a multitude of other things that could have been traumatic to somebody. Why is it always the same kind of trauma? These are just things that I want us to keep in mind. I know that took a while, but I think covering all the things that we covered in the intro was important and uh, just a friendly request. If you could like this video or share it with somebody, leave a comment, um, leave a rating. If you're listening to it as a podcast, that would be great, but really more so for a uh, YouTube. I just said a lot of words that I think could possibly get flagged to suppress this video. And obviously I think it's an important topic. So, um, if you could leave a comment, share it with somebody, leave a like on the video to tell YouTube that it's still important and please don't suppress it. I would really, really appreciate it because it's not going to get any better from here. We're going to keep going into the territory uh, that YouTube doesn't really love. And I think it's important to speak about these things frankly and honestly and use the appropriate words. So that's what we're going to do. Let's get into episode one. We open in a pool. Teal is there. She is holding a woman who is shaking and crying and kind of mumbling under her breath. And they show this for a few seconds. And then this woman ends up standing in the pool and just screaming gutturally as Teal is walking away. And then it goes to the title card. Right off the bat, this sets the scene. This documentary is going to be intense and it's going to be emotional. After the title card, we get some behind-the-scenes footage of one of Teal's live events. Teal is talking to her team and security about how she is not a typical celebrity, and so they need to make sure that they are on their game, and they need to keep people away from her because she's afraid they're going to flank her when they see her, but they need to do it with tact because uh, she is the one who they listen to at 3 a.m. when they want to kill themselves. And the way that she speaks, I think a lot of my kind of negative response to Teal is the way that she says things because 
this is like a valid point. It's like, hey, as a spiritual, you know, guru or leader to these people, um, I've helped them through a lot of hard things. And so their, their emotions might just overwhelm them. They might want to come up to me and be very close to me and not leave me alone, but we need to make sure that the event runs smoothly. So, you know, please be tactful, please be gentle with them, but also we really need to enforce these boundaries so that way everybody's safe. Like, This makes total sense. But the way that she says it, it's like she's smiling when she says, you know, I'm the one they listen to at 3 a.m. when they want to kill themselves. Rubs me the wrong way. And that's also part of uh, something that I've heard her speak about in The Gateway. She says that she's just like (laughs) the best at search engine optimization. She, uh, uh, you know, she knows exactly what hashtags to use, how to get people to click on her video when somebody's depressed and they want to kill themselves and they search, all, search like, I'm so miserable, I want to die. She's the first one that comes up. And in my head, I'm like, Teal, if you're such a guru, like if you're so enlightened, shouldn't you just trust that the universe is going to bring the right people to you? Why do you need to take advantage of modern technology and hashtags in your videos to get people to see them? You should just trust that they're going to find the people that they need to find. But Whatever. We won't get too much into that. Then they do some brief snippets of interviews with attendees of this live event, and they are just giving Teal like the highest praise that I have heard in a very long time. And one woman says that it's, quote, Teal's mission to heal us all, end quote. And the purpose of these live events is to, um, it's kind of like a a forum somewhat. Basically, there's an audience, Teal's on stage, and then she's selects different people from the audience to come up and share like what they're struggling with and what their problem is. And she gives them advice to help them through it. Um, A lot of the advice that she gives isn't really concrete. It's not like tangible. It's not um, anything that you can really say like, oh, well, Teal told me to do X, Y, Z, and this issue will be corrected. It's kind of like um, sidestepping bullshit. Like, there's no other way to say it. It's like this mumbo jumbo that's supposed to sound really profound. And it makes the people feel good in the moment. But there's nothing really concrete there. So in these first clips of seeing people coming up to the stage to get advice with their struggle, um, it's, it's, it's presented to make the audience believe that Teal is being very helpful, that this advice is great, it's empowering, Teal is so intuitive. The first woman that we see um, says that she's struggling because she just had a baby and she wants to go back to work, but she'll feel like a bad mom if she does that. And Teal says, well, what better example could you set for your daughter than showing her what a woman in her own power looks like? Yeah, that's great advice. I agree with that. The next set of people we see are two people on stage. Uh, They're apparently unrelated. They don't know each other. Teal was like, I feel like there's some connection between you guys. And so that's why I brought you both up. Turns out both of the women on stage um, were children of parents who had had an affair that ended the marriage. So, So I know that that's kind of confusing, but it's like one of your parents cheated on their spouse and now your parent is the cheater and the person that uh, they cheated with and it ended the marriage. And so both of them were from, they were born in that same way. And yeah, like, wow, Teal just magically called these people up. She's so insightful. She's so intuitive. How could she possibly know that they had this connection unless she is who she says she is? And she has the powers that she says she has. There's lots of cheering. There's lots of clapping. It's supposed to be like lighthearted but profound at the same time. People are laughing. There's smiles. Then we get the contrast of the next attendee who wants help. And interactions like this are why Teal gets a lot of criticism. And we're going to see this theme pop up over and over and over again. Not so much in this episode, but in episodes to come. And it's something that the filmmakers, the documentary filmmakers are really going to focus on. But so this next woman who comes up, um, she's just despondent. She feels lost. She has no hope. And Teal asks her if she feels that way, why is she even here? And the woman thinking that Teal's talking about the the live event is like, well, you know, I, I came to get help. That That is why I'm here so I can change it. And Teal's like, no, no, no. Why are you still on this earth? And Teal encourages this woman to visualize what it would be like to go all the way. What would it feel like to end your pain and to die by suicide? Go all the way with it. Think about it. Visualize it. Sit in it. Live in it. 
And this is something Teal does a lot. She has a video on YouTube that certain portions of it had to be removed from according to YouTube's um, guidelines and like policies. You like it got removed from YouTube. Teal had to take certain things out of it in order to get it re-uploaded. So I don't know what those things were. I haven't watched it, but I have watched the 20 minute video about like visualizing what it would be like to kill <laughs> to kill yourself. Um, and I can kind of understand why she would say like visualize both sides, like visualize what it would be like if you did die by suicide and then visualize what it would be like if you were able to get better, if you were able to overcome this, if you were able to find joy, like, you know, go, go through both sides. And part of her video, which I guess makes sense. And, and I don't know how comforting this is, but I've seen a lot of people say that it was helpful. I saw a lot of people in the comment section saying that they appreciated her saying this. Um, I, have not struggled with suicidal ideation. So again, I can't speak to how personally helpful this is. But Teal says in that video, take the time to watch this video because if you want to kill yourself now, take comfort in knowing that you can always kill yourself in five minutes. You can always kill yourself tomorrow. If nothing I say is helpful, you can kill yourself as soon as you stop watching this video. So, you know, take just take the time to watch it and hear what I have to say. And just always remember that even if you don't kill yourself now, that option is available to you. And that's like, that's where it crosses a line for me. It's kind of reminiscent of like, you can do anything for a minute at a time, or you can do anything for 10 seconds at a time. If you're really struggling with something, if you can make it through the next 10 seconds, you're going to be okay. And you can do it again and you can do it again and you can make it through the next 10 seconds and then the next 20 seconds. And like, you can keep pushing forward. But then we get to the point where um, instead of like just leaving it there, it's because you can always kill yourself later. Teal's not necessarily trying to talk people out of killing themselves because Teal doesn't see anything wrong with somebody killing themselves. She says that dying is like a reset button. She believes in reincarnation. And so she says like, if you truly don't see a way that this life can get better for you, there's nothing wrong in, in dying by suicide because you'll just reincarnate. But, you know, that's up to you. You have to fully commit to life or fully commit to death because being just depressed and, and living ex as you're living right now, just existing like this isn't anything. So either you commit to life or you commit to death. And that's a very, very dangerous thing to tell people. And again, we will talk about it more because this is not like this this attendee having this conversation with Teal is not the only time that this topic is going to come up. It's not like something she said just offhand. It's a very big part of her brand and her presence on the internet. After the footage of her live event, it goes to the documentary crew interviewing Teal. And Teal says that she never ever wanted to get into this field because she hated spirituality. But one day she just started speaking and that speaking is her most natural talent. And she just happened to blow up on YouTube despite being an SEO expert. Uh, she says that uh, she now has millions of members in the Teal tribe and that she is a spokesperson for people who are considered to be the lost toys, but not everybody is ready for her enlightenment and truth. Then it cuts to uh, Teal having a business meeting with her manager, Matthias, and he's going over her social media following. Uh, he says that right now they have 1.2 million followers on Facebook and that the next step in terms of competition is to reach 2.4 million followers because that's where Eckhart Tolle is and that's where Deepak Chopra is. He also says that Tony Robbins has 4 million followers, so he wants to know how they can reach that level and get above him. And yes, I can hear the argument. Well, the more people know about her, the more people Teal can help. But also, if you're so spiritually enlightened, why are you concerned about the numbers of people who are who like your Facebook page? There's an opposition there for me that I can't seem to come to reconciliation with because, again, I, I, I get the devil's advocate argument of it, but what comes with a large following is money and fame and status. And I, I tend to think that that's important to Teal. Next, they go to a scene of Blake, who is Teal's head of operations, and Teal in a bathroom together, and he is dyeing Teal's hair for her. Blake shares that he met Teal for the first time when he was 19, and he felt like she was somebody who actually saw him. Like, he felt like meeting Teal was like meeting somebody who saw him for real for the first time. He shares that they lived together for 16 years and he says that Teal can meet anybody on any level of suffering because she's experienced the worst of the worst and she's gotten through it. And then we see Teal reading an excerpt from one of her books and um, in this documentary is the first time we hear 
Teal giving us a glimpse of what she claims happened to her as a child. Teal says that she was targeted by a family acquaintance who ended up being a psychopath and kept her captive and underground for 13 years. She says that in 2001, she was sitting at the bottom of a hole with her hands and feet tied and she was tired of running from the pain. So she decided decided to develop a process that can make even the most hurt and fractured person whole again. This method is what Teal calls the completion process. And, um, basically just like high level overview of the completion process is that you do it with a practitioner who is certified by Teal, like trained and certified by Teal and has been through the completion process themselves. And you talk about something that's triggering you. So say your partner's cooking, they're making broccoli and you get super freaking anxious. You get angry, you lash out, you have some sort of negative reaction to your partner cooking dinner and um, part of that dinner being broccoli. And so you explain why that happened. And so you kind of go backwards into your past and they ask questions like, well, when was the first time you noticed yourself feeling anxious while your partner was in the kitchen cooking? What were they cooking? What was the meal? Oh, it was broccoli. And weren't they cooking broccoli this time when you got triggered? Okay, well, when's the first time you can remember feeling triggered by broccoli? And like you go into all of this and all the way back into the very first time that that thing was associated with something bad happening that apparently formed this negative connection in your mind and is the reason that this anxiousness or trauma or anger or hatred, whatever, keeps coming up for you. And then once you can target that memory, you relive it consciously talking through it with your practitioner until you've gone through all of it and explored it and gotten everything out. And then as a result of you being able to relive it in a safe space, you're supposed to be able to overcome this thing. And again, this is something Teal does that sounds like it could be reasonable. It sounds like, well, hey, maybe that could be a good method and maybe that could work for somebody. And if you can figure out why the scent of broccoli triggers you, then you can be better prepared to tackle the world. And, you know, again, broccoli as an example, but like you can better equip yourself to be more successful and to not get so frustrated. You can overcome your negative emotions surrounding broccoli, right? Like it sounds like this could work for some people, but It's concerning to me that the people who are facilitating this process are merely people who have gone through the completion process camp themselves and Teal has said, yep, you can do it. They're not held accountable to anybody other than Teal. They're not like reporting to a board. They don't have to go through continued education. They don't have to maintain a license. There's nothing formal about what they are doing and that can lead to some really negative outcomes. So we get this like horrible image of a teenager being held in captivity. Her hands and feet are bound. She's desperate to escape pain. She is just like in the worst spot that you can be. And she decides that she's not going to run from it. She creates the completion process. And then like the next thought out of her mouth is, I started hosting retreats to teach other people the completion process and help them go through it. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, how do we get from being at the bottom of a hole to, and so I started hosting retreats. You know, obviously there's more to the story, but it's just kind of kind of like a jump that you're like, okay, all right. So so now we're just talking about retreats. Sounds good. Uh, So these completion process retreats are to help people work through their trauma. And she claims they transform the attendees' lives. The documentary shows a few brief shots of interviews from people who are attending this retreat. And one woman says that she believes Teal is Jesus. And so she doesn't understand why other people wouldn't treat her as such. Then they show what is presented as like the first meeting of the retreat, you know, like the first time they're all gathering together. I don't know if it actually is or not, but that's how it's framed. And Teal says that her approach is not a quick fix, which is what most people want. And she is in the business of emotional healing. And she understands that her approach is controversial because it goes against what many psychologists say is healthy, especially in terms of reliving memories and soul retrieval. Chew on that one. She says some nice things that sound encouraging. Um, uh, You know, she says like people who come here, the question isn't what's wrong with you. It's what happened to you. And she wants people to take a look at their lives through the lens of trauma to help them move through it and recover. 
Um, so like, again, like it, it sounds nice. It's her saying like, you're accepted here. You're not wrong because you're here, but we need to overcome what happened to you. And it sounds very encouraging and like a, a healthy healing place, if you will. I don't know that I would describe it like that, but that's kind of the feeling of it. Um, however, it's also kind of eerie. And I think part of that is because the music that they're playing underneath it, but it's just it makes you feel uneasy watching this scene. I don't know. Maybe it's because she's messing with people and their innermost traumas and the worst things in the world that happened to them without being held accountable to anybody. Maybe that's why it made me uncomfortable. I don't know. Anyway, Teal then breaks the attendees up into pairs so that way they can practice the completion process with each other, which is where you go back to a moment of trauma and consciously relive it because that's how they're going to be able to heal from it. And one of the poor attendees, um, obviously, it's, they're, they're partnered up. It's two women. One of these women is the one who's experiencing the completion process. And she is crying. She is shaking. She is rocking back and forth and talking about how angry she is at her mom. And she is reliving this memory of her wanting to stab her mom. That way her mother can feel all the pain that she has inflicted. This attendee says that she has never had anybody be there for her and that she was raised with every touch being unsafe. And as this process goes on, I'm trying not to lose it because I cried very hard when I saw this. Um, She's getting more emotional and more emotional and she just starts screaming and sobbing and saying, I just want it to be safe. I just want a touch to be safe. And it just breaks my heart seeing this. You know, the woman who was completing this completion process with her was very kind and very gentle and asked, you know, how can I help you? Is it okay for me to touch you? This is a safe touch. This is a safe place. Like this you know, this woman is being very compassionate and empathetic to the other woman who is crying. But it just hits you how hurt some of the people who seek out Teal Swan are. It shows you what they've endured. It, imagine, I don't know how old this woman is, probably in her 20s or 30s, but imagine like still at this point in your life, because of what you went through with your mom saying like, touch is not safe. There is no safe touch. Having no concept of what that's like. Like, these people are hurt and they're going through really hard things. And I'm not going to say that Teal is incapable of helping any of them. Um, but I will say that the stakes are high. The risks of her business and the field that she's in are high. And I hope she understands that responsibility. And I hope that she accepts it and acts responsibly. But I know that there are certain instances in which she does not. She does not respect the responsibility that she's been given and the trust that these people are putting in her. And that's really frustrating. And it makes me very scared. And it makes me very sad for people who are seeking her out because they are going through such a hard time or because they have experienced so much trauma. It's it's a lot to process. So um, right after that scene, there is like a montage with Teal speaking over it about she's explaining the completion process and it shows people crying, falling to their knees. Um, they're in emotional distress, just like screaming and it's silent because Teal's doing a, like a voiceover of it, but it's showing all these people going through this emotional turmoil. And then it just cuts to, <laughs> to moments of people like singing together and playing the ukulele and hugging and rubbing each other's backs and like sitting in a circle and just having a great time and laughing and doing all these group activities and stuff. And one woman uh, calls somebody, presumably at home, uh, like somebody back at home, and says that she wants them to know that when she comes back, she's going to be completely different because of this process. She is going to be changed. Which I don't know if I've mentioned this because I feel like I've been talking for forever. But just because you have a method of something that helps you overcome something you're going through doesn't mean that that thing is going to like stick forever, right? It's, it, you know, some people like say with therapy, Somebody might be going through something really, really hard and so they go to therapy and the therapist teaches them how to overcome that thing or gives them tactics and approaches that they can use when they're experiencing something similar to that thing. And that person might not continue going to therapy for the rest of their lives, but they're probably going to take those tools 
and they're going to continue to use them because they've been helpful. And so it's like, there's not one thing you can do that's going to fix everything and like make it so that way you never have to, um, you know, experience something bad again, or you never have to live in trauma again. Like personal development and self-actualization and progress is, it's, it's a progression. It's something that we do continually over time for the rest of our lives. So um, this completion process, it might change people's perspective on things or they might have a breakthrough while they're there, but you can't just go away for two weeks and come back and say, I am a completely changed person. I'm a completely different person. Nothing about me is the same. I guess if something traumatic happens to you, that could probably be true. But in terms of like personal development and overcoming trauma, um, just because you have a realization or you feel a little bit better, it doesn't necessarily mean that this is a switch that got flipped and now that trauma no longer affects you, right? It It's going to be a continual process. It's going to be something that takes time and healing is not linear. There's ups and downs. There's good days, bad days, all of that. Y'all know the point that I'm getting to. Let's move on to a group session where Teal is talking about how uh, when most people go home, they're going to do a complete overhaul of their lives because they realize that they were not living authentically. And so, you know, what are you going to do? You get home and you realize that you just married somebody for convenience or, oh man, I had, I have these two freaking kids and I never wanted kids. What am I supposed to do with that? Or I hate my job. And so they have to be ready to go through the consequences of overhauling their lives. One of the attendees has a question for Teal and he wants to know that if Teal spends all of her time calling out other people's BS, is there anyone above her that she has respect for who would be allowed to challenge her? And Teal wants to know why that person thinks that that's an important question. In my opinion, that is a completely valid question to ask, but Teal disagrees. She gets angry and defensive at being questioned and she kind of lashes out. And in my opinion, tries to make that person asking feel stupid for asking the question, like, who can hold you accountable? She says that she's never met anybody who is more enlightened than her, so why would she let anybody else call her out or hold her accountable if they're not above her? Like, it's it's odd. I'm going to play the whole clip for you. I don't think I can screen record the video on Hulu, so it'll most likely just be audio, but You'll get the you'll get the feeling of how uncomfortable it was to watch that and like how um, kind of like it's kind of like a quiet rage that Teal has. It's she's not yelling at him. She doesn't blow her top. But you can sense the anger underneath the surface at somebody having the audacity to question Teal Swan. So I'm um, good person. If you spend all your time calling people's BS, right? Is there anyone out there team that you would have enough respect for that they could challenge you? It's a strange question. Why is that an important question? Hmm? Why? I should have someone above me. Not above you? Like, who do you look up to? to I call? don't look up to anyone. But I, and so I have resistance against that, if I'm being brutally honest. Why? I should have someone above me. It's not going to happen. Is that stubbornness? I wouldn't be particularly aware if I wasn't able to recognize the potential of someone having more awareness than me. I've never met them. You seem to go into resistance about this. I want to know what it's about. Yeah, I do feel that way. Where is the sticking point with you? I'm not here thinking that you have all the answers and they're all right. I'm expressing everything that comes up for me, every question, every challenge and opposition. But I also don't have to agree with everything that's been said by you. And no, nor should I blame anyone else. It would be the same if I went to the Dalai Lama today and I said, okay, but like you, you are in this place of like all knowingness, but who's all knowing for you? That's a challenge. The reality for you is you think there's an actual consequence for somebody not having a mentor. You're afraid of that consequence with me. So... I would love if you would spell it out for us why I'm so fucking unsafe if I don't have a mentor. It concerns me that I look up to people and then I then find out 
that they are not who I thought they were. Bikram. John of God. It's an authority thing. I can misuse my power. I can do that. And I had better be aware of that. I could take my skills and I could ruin someone's life with them. I have to be aware of that. Otherwise, I'm not very safe, am I? I have no problem with people not following me if it's the right thing for them. But play a game with me. Pretend that I could round everyone up on the planet and we found who the fastest human was. And then you looked at the fastest human and said, you can't teach me running because you don't have someone faster than you. That's what you're doing to me. So is this really an argument about that? Or is this an argument about the fact that you don't believe that that's me? So then we go back to the interview room and Teal is talking about her childhood. She said that she was different from everyone else and she scared her mother to death because she could see dead relatives, other dimensional entities. She could hear what people were thinking. And she said her parents saw her abilities as curses and that there were other parents in the community who wouldn't let her interact with their children. So her parents took her to multiple therapists and she received, quote, every single diagnostic, schizophrenia, bipolar, borderline, everything. They didn't know what to do with me end quote she then says that a man in his 60s eventually um, comes into the family and he says that he's an alternative practitioner and he wants teal's parents to let teal come with him for the weekends so he can treat her and teal's parents apparently allow this and teal makes a great point she says i never questioned why a man in his 60s would want to spend all of his free time with a child Fair point, Teal. Why would, why, why? Look, they don't cover this in the episode. And we, again, don't know how true this story is. But from outside research, there was an investigation into this, like a formal police investigation. They know the man that Teal is accusing of doing this. And there's been no evidence to substantiate these claims. I think there are elements of truth to this. I think there probably was. This guy was like a veterinarian. And so he was like, oh, well, I can take Teal. She can kind of apprentice with me. She can learn about these things, X, Y, Z. And the dude says that like nothing odd was happening. But the way the dude also talks, it's like, I feel like your motivations are a little bit suspect. Like, why would you want to take a child under your wing that you're not like related to and isn't, um, I don't know, an intern at like an intern because they're in veterinary school. Like there's certain elements of the story that are very uncomfortable from his side. Um, but there's also things that I think are exaggerated on her side. So it's kind of hard to find the happy medium and figure out what the most likely scenario is of things that happened. But anyway, um, so Teal says like her parents just let this guy start taking her on the weekends to treat her. And, then they show Teal going through her childhood journals and we can see her flipping through them. Like we see the physical existence of these journals. She's not just saying like, well, I journaled this. We can see it. And um, she's talking about how this man started raping her in the early 90s. He started drugging her with ketamine. He told her that if she told anybody what he did, he would kill her parents and her horse. She says that she was kept in a pit that he dug in his backyard. And she talks about the first time that she was admitted to a psych ward due to a suicide attempt. And something interesting to know is that Teal says in one of the instances of her being raped, it was in a church underneath our house is how she phrased it. And I think for most people, if you're hearing this woman talk about how starting when she was like six years old, um, she's being raped and assaulted and drugged, like you're just going to be so overwhelmed with that information that you might not catch at a church under our house. And um, when she says our house, I believe she means the house that she was allegedly kept captive in. And it makes me just, it it just adds another element of doubt because you're saying there was a church underneath your house and you're saying that, she's not saying this, but we know in, in real life, in reality, this abuse, alleged abuse was reported to the police. The police investigated it. Teal said who did it to her. Teal identified the man who allegedly abused her for 13 years. 
and police were not able to find any physical evidence. Like Teal says, I was held, I was raped in a church underneath our house. Where's the church that was underneath the house? So with Teal saying that this thing happened in a church underneath the house, when people know who this person is that she's accused of doing these things to her, and it's not just her, it's part of a satanic ritual abuse cult, what are the odds that Teal, like if, if this church underneath the house exists, right? What are the odds that Teal is the only person who was abused there? Slim to none. What are the odds that after Teal escaped, the satanic ritual abuse on this mass scale stopped, right? I'm not saying that they should be able to go find this church underneath the house if it exists and say like, yep, we can find a physical proof of Teal being here and this thing happened because this was years ago. But there would have to be something. There would have to be something. There would, like, there would, something to substantiate this. And again, I'm not saying that nothing bad happened to her. I'm not saying that whatsoever. I very firmly believe that something happened to Teal or she went through some kind of trauma. Maybe it was related to these mental health diagnoses that she doesn't believe the validity of, but, but something clearly was not like 100% right and safe and healthy. And that's further evidenced by seeing the journals, some of like inside the, the these journals, Teal's created these art pieces and they are dark. Like they are sad. Thinking about a teenager or a child creating these pieces of art, it's clear that something was going on. But when Teal creates these grandiose stories of this systematic abuse that there's no evidence of and nobody else backing up other than a therapist who's been accused of recreating false memories in children to say that they were abused, it makes it hard to believe. It makes it hard to say like, I firmly believe everything you're saying and this is true. And a side note, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. While some of um, Dr. Barbara Snow's cases like the allegations that she made while some of those did go to trial and result in convictions several of those convictions have been overturned due to the lack of evidence so again not saying whether these people who ended up getting sentenced to jail are innocent or guilty i just think that's important information to have so moving on from the scene of teal going through her journals she says that she eventually realized that she needed to get away from her abuser and she drove to blake's house again i would i would love to know how that happened if you were held captive for 13 years how did you just leave like what did that look like how did how did you get a car how did you drive to Blake's house how did you meet Blake I have lots of questions um and she says that Blake took care of her and let her heal and they fell in love and that um Blake loved her unconditionally and being loved by Blake was the first time that she'd experienced that sort of unconditional love by somebody who kept her safe and allowed her to heal from the things that she had been through. And obviously they entered into a romantic relationship and that relationship did only last a year according to Teal, but she says that after they broke up, they never stopped living with each other. She also shares that she has been married five times, but Blake has always stood by her and that Teal's son considers Blake his second dad. Teal then goes on to say that no matter what happens, she and Blake will be in each other's lives forever. Then we cut to a scene in Bavaria, Germany, where we meet Juliana, who is a follower of Teal, and she is in a romantic relationship with Blake. Juliana explains that she was searching for community, and that's how she found Teal. At first, she was just watching Teal's videos, and then she eventually decided to travel to one of the completion process retreats, and that is where she met Blake. And um, she mentions that at these completion process retreats, you truly feel seen. And that's what so many people want, which I think is a very poignant thing to point out. Then we find out that Juliana is moving from Germany to Utah to become a member of Teal's family. Um, Teal, obviously she has like the Teal tribe, but then she has this like inner circle and community where several members of the Teal tribe, including Blake, they all live together in one place. It's like the family. They're all together. They're part of the family. And Blake's really excited for Juliana to join the family. Um, And there's a conversation between Juliana and her mom. Her mom's not happy. Her mom says that she has a bad feeling about this and she's very, very nervous for her daughter to move, which is understandable in general. Like your kid's moving from Germany to the USA. 
th- that's got to be scary. You you don't want your kid to be that far away from you. But um, I think again, it's kind of like foreshadowing that her mom is so. Her mom's not like I'm excited for you, but I'm gonna miss you. Her mom is saying, I have a bad feeling about this. Juliana's mom is upset, and Teal, on the other hand, is pissed. We see Teal and Blake and several other people sitting in a hot tub having a conversation about Juliana moving in with them. And Teal says that she thinks Blake just wants to live his life and do whatever he wants without any consequences. She wants to make sure Blake recognizes and remembers that he has a lot of responsibilities and she doesn't want him to get distracted by love. I would like to point out that according to your own story, this man took you in and took care of you after you escaped from captivity and did not judge you. He kept you safe. He provided for you. He loved you. He helped you heal. He has stood by you while you've been in, Teal says, like 13 to 14 relationships since him. Five marriages. You had a kid with somebody else. He is your head of operations. He dyes your hair for you. He is at your beck and call. He is at the live shows on stage introducing Teal, making sure she stays on time. Like he does everything for her. And the second he finds love, she's all, "Mm -mm, you have responsibilities. You can't be distracted by love. Okay. Okay. Blake expresses in response to this that he feels his life is very serious. And the way that Teal run things is a little bit more strict than they would probably be if he was running his own household. And he just has this desire to be around the woman that he loves. And as the conversation kind of goes on, it's revealed that, you know, Teal's obviously concerned about Blake and she wants to make sure he remains available to do absolutely any and everything for her at a whim. But she's also concerned that if somebody moves in with them, they'll have an instant platform because then they can go to the media and say, I lived with Teal Swan and like X, Y, Z happened. So she reminds Blake that he has not chosen a simple life and he needs to think about these things. Teal also mentions that it takes her a very long time to understand if she can truly trust someone and she doesn't know Juliana that well. Which is ironic to me because I would ask the question, Miss Teal, If you are truly as intuitive as you say you are, shouldn't you be able to like feel her energy and know if you can trust her? And if we go back to what she said about her abilities as a child, you know, she said she could hear people's thoughts. Maybe this ability went away as she got older. I don't know how having Claire audience works, but she can hear people's thoughts or she could at one time. Why can't you just hear Juliana's thoughts and figure out what her true intentions are? I don't know, maybe maybe bring those talents back, bring that skill back into practice so that way you don't have to worry about it. As the episode comes to a close, the footage goes back to one of Teal's live events and one of the attendees is on stage saying that she can't decide whether or not to fully commit to life or death. She expresses that she feels she is continually straddling the fence. And Teal tells this woman that she's not alone and she turns to the audience and wants a raise of hands of how many people feel like they are just not doing okay at all in life. And there's probably like two, 300 people in attendance if I had to guess and the majority of the people in that room raise their hand. The next scene is a compilation of different content creators and media outlets criticizing Teal and they mention that her practice is unregulated, that she's referred to suicide as a reset button, that sometimes the easiest thing to find online isn't the best thing to find online. And of course, this is coming from like 20, 30 different creators. It's like a bunch of clips, one right after the other, sometimes overlapping, but those are some of the things that we hear people bringing up. And then we see uh, Teal's manager, Matthias, watching this compilation and um, I shouldn't be laughing. I think I think it's a it's a funny scene to see like somebody's manager hearing all of this negative press about the person you manage, but um, it is actually very serious because the last clip that they play is a woman saying, "You would have to convince me otherwise that Teal's teaching did not play a significant role in the mind of our daughter when she took her life." And her manager sees this and just places his head in his hands and says, "Oh God." And um, we'll go more into that story within the upcoming episodes. So after that scene, finally, we have footage going back and forth between Teal and her team in Las Vegas and Juliana coming through the airport um, as she's leaving Germany and getting ready to travel to her new home. Teal and her team are standing in front of the fountains at the Bellagio. It's nighttime. And just a side note, the cinematography in this documentary is so good. It's 
very um, like emotionally captivating and it makes you feel things. And I feel like at some points you kind of forget that this is a documentary. Like that's how well it's shot. But anyway, Teal and her team are in front of the fountains at the Bellagio and Teal says that this career is where she lives and dies. And she's trying to end a cycle of suffering and you either understand this or you get off the ship. She also says that she wants to get to a point where she is more spiritually influential than the Pope and people can say, oh, that's not going to happen. But fuck, that's not going to happen. Cut to the credits. We covered a lot of ground in this episode. I think the information that was presented by the deep end was very important to understanding kind of Teal's approach and how she thinks about things and how she feels about herself. And I am super excited to see how this story progresses. Because again, I do have um, outside knowledge of Teal from before watching this. So I know a lot of things that have happened in real life that they've not covered in the documentary yet. And I don't even know if they will cover them. Uh, Some of the things I know that they will because I've seen like the preview for the next episode. But I think this was a good starting place and I hope that the background I provided was helpful. I hope that I was able to express concerns in a tactful way. So I hope I did that. And that's all I've got for today. If you are watching this on YouTube, I would love if you let me know what you thought of this video in the comment section down below. Let me know if you've watched the documentary, how you felt about it, how you feel about Teal. I would love to hear your opinions. And um, if you are listening to this as a podcast, if you could leave a review, that would be great. That would be super helpful. I would appreciate it. Maybe subscribe to the Uh, show. I'm still getting the verbiage down of podcasting because this is the first time I'm recording content for both YouTube and podcasting, but we'll get there eventually. Anyway, while you are doing those things, if you could subscribe to the channel on YouTube, that would be amazing. And if you are subscribed already, thank you so much. I am so appreciative of you and I love being able to just sit here, hang out with you and talk about whatever. Thank you so much for watching or listening. Please be kind to people and I will see you in the next one. Bye.